information about it. First of all, um, usually I don't deal with hardware. But my reference to e-token or electronic token goes back to a kind of project which I had last year. I did work together with a university for applied sciences. And we had a small project that dealt with how to integrate uh, e-token into a, a certain infrastructure. And as a result, I thought, well, this is so important, let's do a talk about it. This is an e-token. An e-token looks like that. Most of you may say, well, this is also a USB stick. When I first saw this device, yeah, it looks like an USB stick. Electronic token is a little bit more. It's a little bit more than a USB stick. Officially, it looks like a USB stick, but it's a smart card with a cryptographic processor. E-token is the abbreviation of electronic token. And you may know it from your credit card. It's also a smart card, but this one is more usable. This is a smart card with a USB interface, which you can connect to your computer and use. In the project I was um, working with, I used these tokens, these electronic tokens that were supplied by Aladdin. Aladdin is um, a hardware company that produces these devices. Aladdin has um, his main office in Israel. And as we talked with them, well, they are more or less open. Sometimes it was very hard to get any documentation from them. It took us about six to seven months so that they talked with us. What's the idea of this e-token? The idea is that you have a reliable user authentication. You must, sometimes you also need a certain access, an access mechanism for sensitive areas. It means you have data, you have access possibilities, and you want to protect your data and your privacy. Therefore, you can use either passwords, you can also use, let's say, a kind of big um, person standing at the door, or you can also use um, this e-token. If you use passwords, you have several risks. The first risk is it's just taken away. Someone comes around, tries to kill you, and takes your password. More common is that you just forget your password. It does happen, it does happen very often. Sometimes your password, let's say, is not very safe. Sometimes you can guess it, you can crack it. So, well, it's not a nice case. And the more logins you have, the more passwords you need. When I prepared this presentation, I thought, well, how many logins do I have? How many passwords do I have? And then I said, well, 5, 10, 15, 20. I don't know how many logins and passwords you have. I think the number may be much higher. Who has more than 10 logins? Who has more than 10 passwords? Ah, there's a difference. Who has more than 20 logins? Who has more than 20 different passwords for these 20 logins? Uh-huh, okay, there's a difference. So this may be um, quite useful that you have a look at this e-token philosophy. There exist several variants of this e-tokens. On the left side, you see several variants. The upper one is the one that I used. This is so-called e-token professional. It means it just looks like a simple USB stick. People who do not know this may think, well, it's just a USB stick and nothing else. So it's quite safe. You can also have um, these electronic tokens 
with uh, one-time passwords, with one-time phrases, this is this one. This means there's a kind of crypto chip on it, and this crypto chip um, creates unique numbers. It means you do not have to log in only, you just have to type in this numbers that is displayed on this token. And this may be displayed only for about 10 minutes, and then you have to take the next one. One of the common ways is also the smart card. The smart card is shown here. It's just like a credit card way. Well, well for this uh, smart card kind of thing, it's, um, well, you can put it in your wallet, or maybe you put it in your pocket, and then you sit on it, and it may be broken then. These electronic tokens are supported for several operating systems. It means for Windows 2000, 2003, XP, and also Vista. I don't know whether they are supported for Windows 7, but they are also supported for Linux and for Mac. Internally, they are available with an amount of memory of 32K, 64K, or also 72K. This can be used for storing passphrases and can be used for storing certificates. Depending on uh, the model you choose, you have different sizes. And depending on the model you have, you have different security mechanisms. It means that you have um, LSR, it means 100, uh, no, it means 1024-bit security and also 2048-bit security. There's a question. You just told that the smart card was uh, prone to uh, damage for sitting on it, putting it in your wallet. How, is the, how are the other devices protected against that? I will answer this question in a few seconds. It's on the next slide. For this uh, e-token, you have several RPs and standards. It means PKCS11. This is the official standard. There are several RPs, means Microsoft CRP and also PCSC as CRP. For this e-token, I thought, well, the official numbers is minus 40 degree to plus 85 degree. And I thought, this cannot be true. And I thought, hmm, let's give it a try. As you see, this is something like that. This is such an e-token. And I put it into my washing machine. And I thought, well, let's see what happens. I put it up to 60 degree. Then I dried it. Then I put it in. Then it did work again. I was not sure before doing that, but after that, I thought, well, OK, it did work. Furthermore. Um, the company says, well, there's a guarantee for data storage of about 10 years. Well, this is the official statement. I'm not sure whether this is true. I cannot prove it. I own such a USB token for about one year now. I don't know whether it will work in about 10 years. You know, it's a kind of electronics, and electronics may work. Such an e-token costs about 30 euro if you buy a single one. Usually you get a kind of bundle which includes about eight e-tokens. The question we had before, is whether these uh, e-tokens are safe or not. I think, for example, with a washing, washing machine is quite impressive. It does work. You can also put it around with you. I put this e-token, which I have about one year around with me. It doesn't matter whether it was warm or it was cold. It does work all the time. Mechanical stress, will that have any impact on the device? Mechanical stress, will that have any impact on the device? Like a bending or put it in your back pocket and then sitting on it? I could not find any negative uh, effects on it. It did work all the time to my great surprise. 
Now let us have a look at uh, the software stack. It may, maybe you want to include it in your own software. You have several layers which you have to think about. The first one is the Linux kernel, which is at the bottom. Then you, have, then you need a certain driver. At this level, this is a so-called Omnikey Cartman driver, for example. This one is needed just to communicate that, uh, that the kernel communicates with the device. Then you have the PCSC light driver. This is needed just for another level of communication. Then you have a certain package, which means OpenSC. OpenSC, OpenSC um, deals with a PKCS ELF interface, and this is the interface which helps to communicate with the applications, which stay on top of this level. And on top of this, you have the application level. There you can use uh, applications such as PAM for authorization. Here's a list of levels in detail, but I think we can also skip to the next slide. For PKCS ELF, this is a kind of standardization. And um, on the view, if you look at the token, um, the e-token is just a small device. This small device saves objects on a storage device, and this e-token just allows some cryptographic functions on the token, nothing else. These objects can be data, this can be certificates, and this can also be keys. These keys or these objects are available public or private. For this electronic token, you have two roles. One of it is the owner. This owner can only access the private objects. And then you have a so-called security officer. And the security officer can access the public objects only. The security officer is usually a kind of system administrator that keeps the e-token. And if, um, if it is in a certain company, then he gives you the token and he does all the administ administrative um, things that have to be done with the token. For the applications, the applications are session-based. It means that the application can communicate with this e-token. There is a session needed. The session is initialized and it simplifies and says, okay, we just have to include um, reading and writing of objects. Now, I would like to have a look on the available software and libraries. The most common library is the so-called OpenSC library. This is a so-called smart card framework. It is available for Linux, Mac, and Windows. It supports digital identity cards. It's, let's say, a result of uh, all the projects that exist before. It combines several sub-projects, for example, OpenCT. OpenCT is uh, the driver, the sub-project driver for the smart card reader. Then you have uh, modules for authentication, for example, PAM or PAM PKCS11. You can, you can also have Java bindings so that you can include it in your Java program. And you can also have PKCS11 libraries where all the PKCS11 functions are covered. Well, you may expect that we have a kind of uh, user interface for accessing eToken. The user interface I normally show is um, the command line. And I think um, when I had a look at this eToken thing, I thought, well, let's see what's going on. What can be done with an eToken if you plug it into your 
device into your machine. This is a list of commands I found which can be done without any uh, problems. I will switch to a command line console so that you see oh, how simple this can be. First of all, if you get uh, this electronic token and you plug it into your machine, you will, see, you will see there's a kind of light on it. It will show you a red light so that it's connected to the machine. After it finished blinking, we can have a look on it. This command just have a look at all the connected e-tokens and shows which ones are connected. What we see is we have uh, an Aladdin e-token pro connected. It checks all the USB slots. It says, okay, there's just one. We see it's connected to slot number zero. Now we want to have a look at the operating system of the e-token. We have to use the tool card OS info and we have to provide the slot number. Now we get some information what's on the machine what's on the token. For me it was quite impressive because I figured out, oh yes, we have a small company providing some operating systems. Small company. And it's quite new. I got this e-token, I think, last year, in 2008. And there's an operating system which is about seven years old, more than seven years old. What I also think is quite interesting, you can see the serial number. The serial number is here. Quite simple. So you can see, ah, OK. I got an e-token for following serial number. As you see, this is a command line tool. This can also be used in a shell. So if you just find an e-token, you can figure out which serial number it has. You get some more information, which is quite useful. You get, for example, you get um, the EEPROM size. The EEPROM size is 32 kilobit, kilobyte. You get in some information about the CPU type. You get also some information uh, which memory is already left on the device. This can help you to figure out whether there are information stored on this e-token or not. There's one command um, which has to be done if you get such an e-token at an administrator. You have to initialize this e-token. You have to take this command, pkcsf2 minus minus init token. If it is initialized, then it can be used on your own. Um, I will not show this at the moment, but I think what's more exciting, um, let us have a look on the e-token. It means what's on it. And um, therefore, we would like, or we will use the so-called OpenSC Explorer. You see what I did? I just called the program OpenSC Explorer, and now I have a shell I can work on the e-token. I did not type any password or nothing else. I just typed in the command. Now I have a shell and can work on this e-token. Let's see what's on it. Okay, we have some 
file IDs. FIS IDs on the left, FIS are so called directories. There's no uh, characters, these are just numbers. And you can maybe you, we switch to another directory. Let's see what's there. Okay. FISDF means directory field or data field. It means, okay, there are subdirectories behind. This directory is empty. And if you want to know which commands are available, you just type help. And you see if there's quite a lot. It means you can get information um, which fields are set, which data is stored on it. You can erase the whole card. You can also say, OK, copy a kind of data to your local file system. You can also say, change a pin, because uh, this e-token comes with a an, with an pin, which you have to set. If you want to use it, you can change it, you can save it. I will not change it because I forgot the pin. I changed it sometimes and I forgot it. You can also create files, you can store data on it. It's just a storage kind of thing. Now let's have a look on the last command, open sc tool minus f. It will show you all the files saved on this e-token. There's quite a few data on it. All of this white areas are data that can be read. All of these green things are, let's say, further information. There were also some red things on it. It means, OK, these are areas which cannot be read. These are sometimes, sometimes corrected, sometimes item, let's say, data which cannot be read correctly. Hmm. Some kind of protected data. But more or less, we can see what's on it if there's some fun, is, if there's data on it or if it's empty. In which applications we can use this e-token? There are some people who did quite a lot of work already. The most important website for this is e-token on linux.org. It means there are quite a few applications, few Workarounds, it means you can use it with uh, Firefox or Thunderbird. You can use it with OpenSSH. Um, if you want to use it with OpenSSH, you just have to recompile it. You have to recompile OpenSSH because normally OpenSSH does not support it automatically. Take the source code, translate it, and find it works. It's also working with Air Desktop and also with TrueCrypt. On the web, I found someone who did quite more. Alan Barlow uh, wrote on his or writes on his web page that, there's, um, that there are modules for OpenVPN, for MySQL, for, for GNU PG, and he also offers some modules and packages so he can use the e-tokens with this uh, software. If you want to develop your own programs, you can either use the OpenSC tools. These are heavily documented, and they come with lots of information. So you see which calls to use, which commands to set. And um, this is quite impressive. You should take some time just to read the information. For the RPs, there's Philip OpenSC devil package which you need. It contains C and C++ code. And if you do not want to speak any C or C++, you can use, um, you can do the same with Python. Python comes in the package PyKCS11. This is quite nice because um, it's very simple to communicate using Python with this um, 
with this library. Now let's have a look um, at the advantages and disadvantages. From my point of view, it's an advantage that you have one single USB device for all your access data. You don't have any papers, you don't have to have any wallets, you don't need so many cards, you just have one device and all the uh, data is stored there. It's great, just one thing. You have strong authentication. It means you cannot copy this. This was my first question when I got this e-token. Can I make a backup? The official statement is, no, um, you cannot make a backup. This is designed that you cannot make a backup. So you cannot do it. It means um, you cannot do a backup. Maybe someone else can. You have the possibility to use common interfaces. It means a USB device can be found everywhere. It's very uh, simple. It's portable. You can put it in your, packet, uh, in your pocket. It's very robust. And from the administrator's point of view, it's very simple. You just have a database with all the e-tokens. Um, you put your colleague, you put it um, in the hands of a colleague, and then he has access to certain areas. As a disadvantage, one single USB device containing all the access data. It's not a mistake, but it's also on the right side. From my point of view, this is, this is also negative, because if I lose this device, if I lose this e-token, all my passphrases are gone. So I try to spread them. It means I don't save all the things on that. I think what, it, what a disadvantage is, is a limited number of memory, because such a passphrase also needs some disk space, and if the space is full, you have to take a second one. So you have the same situation as before, you have two e-tokens, because you can't save all the data on that. There's support for selected software only. It means the documentation is not too much. It means we talked with, we tried to talk with Aladdin and did not get that much support. And from my point of view, um, the possibility, or let's say the impossibility to do a backup is also negative. Because if I store all my data, all my passphrases on it, I want to be able to do a backup and put it in a safe place. That's why I also had a look on alternatives. Which alternatives exist? In the Linux magazine, there was a nice article. And a group of developers decided to develop uh, Open Kubus. Open Kubus is similar to an e-token. It's also a device with an, USB with an USB interface. And it's a simple framework for secure authentication. The hardware layout is freely available. You can just read it online. You can get the source code. And it can also be easily integrated into existing programs. There exist libraries for C, Perl, and PHP. And so you can also use it in web applications. With the e-token, with the original e-token, PKCSFs, tools, this is not possible. There's also a server module and a PAM module available. If you don't like the Open Kubus project, you may be interested in the GPF CryptoStick. The GPF CryptoStick was developed by the German Privacy Foundation. And it's a, let's say, this is a prototype. This is not the final product. Currently, it's under development, and version 2 is expected to be released at the end of this year. It's a USB stick with an open PGP card. It has three independent uh, RSR keys on it, each 1,024 bits long. This is needed for signing, crypting, and authentication. 
the keys are created on the card, so they cannot leave the card. And you can also import existing keys. It's compatible for Linux and Windows. And as far as I've seen it, it looks great. I'm very excited what's happening next, and I will have a look on that. Now let's have a look at my references. There's a lots of documentation in several places. The most common source about a library kind of thing uh, is about OpenSC. It means OpenSC.org. Everything is described there. It means all the libraries, all the tools, all the things you need, all the commands, which is quite helpful. If you want to use an eToken with Linux, you use eToken on Linux.org. All the workarounds are written there. It means all the commands are explained. It's really great. It took me about, when I saw this page, it took me about three days, and I thought, wow, this is great. I did not expect it, because sometimes it's hard to get information even from um, Aladdin itself. There's also a wiki about it. At the Humboldt University of Berlin, there's a wiki, which means, OK, we have a wiki for smart card-based authentication. Someone else had the same idea before. Quite helpful. Also for PyCar CS11, there's a, um, a wiki at bit4id.org. And finally, there's an URL which I would like to include because uh, the Muscle environment, the name is quite funny, I think, movement for the use of smart cards in a Linux environment. Uh, I got in touch with this Muscle, uh, I think, in about 2000 or 2001. And this is the basic tool, the basic uh, library set, um, which later became OpenSC. Now, I'm going to finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you would like to contact me, here are my address. And, um, well, if you'd like to come round, you can also do it. I sit here in a Bureau 2.0. Have you ever heard about two point, uh, Bureau 2.0? Nobody has ever heard about it. Then you should come round. Bureau 2.0 is an open source office network located in Berlin. We are 35 developers. We sit together in one space. We have 300 square meters. And um, yeah, all of us work together, several companies, and you can just come around and join. Now I'm open for questions. I see there are some people. Uh, in the, one of the first sheets, you told that uh, passwords were uh, dangerous because they could get stolen. Yeah. Uh, how is this different? Sorry, how is, how, is, how is this different? This can get stolen, can be used by anyone? Um, furthermore, first of all, you just have, you have to get such an e-token. You have to get it somewhere. On this token, there's a kind of um, mechanism which uh, generates uh, a password. So it cannot be taken away. You cannot copy it from, it, from a device. You cannot do it. Okay, but against physical theft, it isn't protected by... No, I can also uh, take I your wallet. I, c I can take it, use it anywhere, and access your files, just yes. like copying a exactly. password. Okay. Exactly. It's just a device. Yeah. You can take it, and if you, ha if you have it, then, you think, then the device where you plug it in thinks that you are me. Uh, but does one protection uh, where it should pin code? For the pin code, you have to remember this pin code. Yeah. This is uh, so that's just, that's the same that's with, just the same with your credit card. Yeah. Then you, if you also have a pin code, it's just the same. Uh, but that pin code you enter through a keyboard or on the device itself? Um, you have I'm, to I'm, enter. I'm just uh, thinking. What about if your computer is 
uh, attacked by a virus or a keylogger to capture key phrases or your pin code, then all your security will be for nothing because your device can get stolen and it's just a small pin code that gets stolen and all your access methods are in the hands of an evildoer. This can happen, of course. So you just have to type it in on a keyboard. Of course, yes. So, the, okay. If, and there, if there's a program that can, let's say, oh. enter the, the typing in process, mm -hmm. that can copy this what you enter, yeah, then you don't have any chance. And another question is, is the device protected against tampering? Uh, can I open it, uh, get the flash chip out and read all your passwords, etc.? And you can uh, give it a try. <laughs> not today, but uh, do you know anything about uh, any protection on it? Well, I think it's waterproof. I've, I've, I've heard about uh, a few companies that make such keys and one of the um, computer magazines, I thought it was a computer magazine in, in the Netherlands, opened such device and uh, used some electronics to read the flash, the flash chip and used that to get to the password. From my point of view, it's not impossible. Um, you, can, you can break it, I think. Officially, there's a kind of standard that um, guarantees that this cannot be done. And if you sell such a product, then you have to follow these standards. It has also it has to be checked. But from my point of view, well, it should be possible. If you have enough, if you have the right tool, then you can open it, from my point of view. If there's uh, someone from the industry or uh, if there's a reseller, uh, he can say something different. Are there any other questions? Oh. Well, uh, I haven't found those devices. I would like to experiment with, it, with them. Do you know where to get to those devices for a rather priceable price for one or two tokens? Um, to get it, there are several distributors where you can get it from. Um, it was part of my project. I was involved with it, and the official price is 30 euro per token. But uh, usually you get a package of about eight, so it might be around 250 euro. Hi, so, um, so these, these smart cards work, there was a long list of software that supports these, right? It's like uh, Thunderbird, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when you say that something like Thunderbird or, or Firefox supports the smart card, which, uh, which authentication are you actually talking about protecting? Does it, does it store the password that you're using for IMAP, perhaps, or something like that? Is that the idea? The idea is just that you authenticate using this token. The password is generated on the token, so it cannot leave the token, cannot leave the hardware. Ah. And um, you can save certificates on the token, which can be used by the application. Currently, um, when, when, I, when I gave this talk last time, there was a question saying, if you save several uh, certificates on the token, how does the application know the right certificate? I cannot answer this question. Right, okay. So, well, if you save 20 certificates on it, I do not have any idea how the application figures out which certificate is the right one. Whether it tries all the certificates, I don't know. Yeah. If you want to help me finding it out, you're welcome. I think Sun used, uh, a few years ago, they started using the smart cards like this for um, secure authentication on their thin clients. And their main problem was that uh, the crappy cards were basically overheating and uh, were ruining the work and they couldn't be used on a prolonged basis more than 30 minutes or so. Um, how often can you, let's say, let's say, how many times per second can you authenticate that it is, it is a valid user using the system? 
only using the USB bus. I do not have any experience uh, answering first questions. It means I cannot say how how much how, how often you can you can use it in this way. Okay. Well, if I may answer, well, ask ask another question. Um, these cars also have a cryptographic uh, sort of engine that, by the nature of it, requires some sort of source of entropy. How many bytes per second can you pull from this device? Random bytes. I think when we have um, have to have a look at the specification, and this specification uh, will be handed over by Aladdin. We tried this for about half a year. We did not get any answer. Yet. After two years. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if there, um, in the in the Microsoft environment, Windows, then, then you have a, a PKY, PKY, PKY uh, infrastructure software, so that you can uh, use a, a, a certificate authority server, etc., 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 and enrollment and enrollment station to create new uh, tokens, etc. Uh, Could you please a bit more loudly? Yeah, uh, there are, there are a number of uh, in, the, in the official PKI uh, infrastructure. There are a number of um, so software things you can use, like a uh, certificate authority and uh, an, an enrollment station where you can create new tokens, mm -hmm. uh, and all these kind of things that are very elaborately uh, developed for Windows. I was wondering what is the current status of such developments uh, for Unix or Linux. Because I do not uh, do not know anything about it. As far as I know, there's no kind of program suite or tool suite which helps you in this way. For the Microsoft world, there exist several applications, several let's say fully for let's say full infrastructures. But for the Linux, um, as far as I know, there exist single tools that have to be combined. So. It's just as usual, you have several tools and you have to figure out how to combine them and how to work with them together. Um, when I was in, in France in July, I met someone who does about a uh, Linux terminal server project, project um, and combines it with eToken. So there must be a kind of infrastructure, but I did not figure it out completely. No more questions? Okay, then I would like to thank the speaker again.